Welcome to the True Hope Cast podcast, where we take a deep dive into mental health's many psychological and physiological aspects. In this beautiful but wild world, this is the show for you if you're looking for motivation, inspiration, knowledge, and solutions. That's what we are all about here at True Hope Canada. And True Hope Canada is a mind and body based supplement company dedicated first and foremost to promoting brain and body health through non invasive nutritional means. For more information about us, you can visit truehopecanada.com. Something new for the podcast is that we're going to be concluding each episode with a two to three solution based idea to a specific question for each guest. Today's guest is Nino Vukovic and today's question is going to be what can I do today to bring awareness to my unconscious unwanted patterns. Nino is a dedicated coach and writer serving wholeness and authenticity. Her work on ego work, shadow work and nervous system work guides individuals towards embracing their true selves. Through personalized one-on-one coaching, workshops, and group events over the past five years, Nino has created safe spaces for self-exploration and growth, fostering an environment where individuals can align with their authentic selves. Her writing shares insights on self-discovery and resilience, inspiring others to live in alignment with who they really are. Today, we're going to be discussing undoing unconscious conditioning for a happier, fuller life. Enjoy the show. Hi, Nino. Hi, Simon. Welcome to True Hope Cast. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. Um, It's nearly Christmas. You've got the Christmas tree behind you there, the snow outside. I do. I wasn't planning for it to be on camera, so I didn't. It's like our... It's beautiful. It's perfect. (laughs) It looks like uh, it doesn't look real, but it looks real enough for Christmas, I guess. Yeah, good. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're going to be talking about unconscious conditioning today. Yes. And a new thing that we're doing with the podcast is we're trying to provide some everyday solutions for people to be able to take away from this podcast right away and implement into their lives. Mm -hmm. And the question we're going to offer some solutions to at the end of the show is going to be, what can I do today to start bringing awareness to my unconscious unwanted patterns? And I think as we go through the podcast, a lot of people are going to understand a little bit more about what that means and and how valuable that can be for for everybody. So let's kick off with who you are and what it is that you do. Sure. Uh, My name is Nino. I am a coach. Um, I've been doing it. I've been coaching for the past three to four years and I've really embarked on my own journey of personal development for the past six years. Okay, so tell us a little bit more about this coaching. Is it is it something that you you do one on one with people in person? Is it online? And then what type of um, what what's the typical session look like? Yeah, it's a good question because there is a lot of um, coaches out there that do a lot of different things and coaching can mean a lot of different things. Um, I do both one-on-one and group coaching. So um, right now I'm mainly doing one-on-one, but I do offer one-off programs here and there, sometimes some programs bigger than others. Um, And the kind of coaching that I do is um, really shadow work. So what shadow work is, is uh, bringing the unconscious conscious. It's called shadow work because it's in the shadow because you can't see it because it's unconscious. So I do a lot of ego work. We do a lot of nervous system work um, to help people bring the unconscious conscious. And what's in, once it's conscious, what do we do about it? Right? Interesting. What's the what's a typical client? Is there is there a, they, I'm sure they come from all walks of life, but I guess how would you come to find someone like you to start challenging your own unconscious unwanted behaviors i guess well people that find me or come to me um already have a little bit of an understanding um about unconscious conditioning or even if the the term unconscious conditioning is not something that is known to them they know that they get in their own way in some way shape or form they realize that they want to there's something they want to do there's a project they want to do where there's relationships they want to improve and something just keeps getting in the way um and so when when they come to me they usually already have something that they've been kind of um struggling with or being with that they want help with okay so they've already got a little bit more of experience with certainly an understanding of what unconscious and conscious patterns are because i think a lot of people if they start thinking about what is being unconscious and what's being conscious that's awake and asleep yes. which, which certainly like you can be awake and asleep but you're actually walking around and you're awake right yes but yeah but a lot of people would when they first think of unconsciousness and consciousness that's kind of like where they would think so maybe you could expand a little bit about what those terms mean mm-hmm. and how it's a little bit 
different from like you just awake and you just asleep and that's it sure um first of all i want to say that we're all a little bit asleep okay uh the the path of personal development and the, the path of doing this work is using your life and and seeing how you're receiving your life to see where you're unconscious and we're going to be talking a bit more about that but um um wait can you repeat the question sure yeah i was just i think a lot of people when if they don't have the experience that you have or they mm -hmm. don't have a little bit of an understanding about the work that you do if you were to just say to somebody or you're like off the street who's got none, none of this doesn't know anything about this like what do the words unconscious and conscious mean to you i think most people would say like oh i'm mm -hmm. unconscious mm -hmm. when i'm asleep mm -hmm. i'm conscious when i'm up and awake right so let's talk about like what's the like the foundation of those words and how that flows into what you do mm -hmm. which is helping people with their unconscious patterns that they have when they're up and about and awake and their brain is you know, going on right so i don't know if you've had this experience before um where you kind of look at your life and something that you've been trying to do or uh something that's been kind of coming up in your relationships and all of a sudden you kind of have the realization of like oh crap i am the common denominator of all of these experiences Right. So in the mm -hmm. past, you were kind of a victim to what was happening to you or this is happening. This is happening, kind of putting the blame out there in the world. This is because of this relationship. This is because of that. And all of a sudden, what actually was unconscious, you 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 have a moment of awareness where you're like, oh, it's actually all over here with me. And then from that awareness, we can start the process of undoing a certain pattern or getting to the root of a certain conditioning that's causing the same experience to keep repeating over and over and over again in your life and where where do we begin to to start having these patterns and these conditions these, this unconscious conditioning where does that start to settle and where does that like begin to grow and then start to become like a huge part of who we are and a lot of those things probably are quite negative from our past that we don't really want to be a part of our future personality. And for a lot of people, it ends up being like that trauma that happened to them years and years ago ends up being a huge part of who they are. And mm -hmm. then without that, who who are they? Mm -hmm. So it ends up becoming a huge part of their identity. And yes. that ends up leading them down a path which isn't really like who they genuinely are. So... It's a long question, but the original question is like, where did the beginnings of these unconscious patterns happen? Where are they mm. born and how do they proliferate? It's a very good question. Um, so first of all, it's, I think it's important to understand that unconscious conditioning and patterns are interrelated, but they're two different things. Okay. So what most people don't understand about unconscious conditioning is that it is the, the, the direct result of an emotional experience. Okay. So most people think, oh, I, I've learned something over and over again, and now it's just ingrained. Um, and when they have that piece of awareness of like, oh, I am the common denominator of all of my experiences. I've been saying I've been wanting to go to the gym and get fit for the past two, three years, and I keep falling off, and it's not something that I'm able to sustain. They go straight into solution mode from their mind. Okay, well, in order to solve this problem, I'm going to put it in my calendar. I'm going to go to the gym three times a week, I'm going to start eating healthy and that's going to be the end of my problems. Right. And then they fall off and then they're frustrated. They don't understand. They, they think something is wrong with them. Um, but it's because they're trying to solve something that was created emotionally and in a nervous system, mm -hmm. logically and with their mind. So I think it's important to understand that unconscious conditioning is the direct result of an emotional experience which created an emotional wound. Okay. And when we talk about patterns, patterns is something we put in place to try to protect ourselves from feeling that emotional wound. That original emotional wound that came up. Yes. It's the way that we've learned to cope with the, 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 the wound and the pain that is there. Can you give us an, like an example of that? Of patterns? Well, of the, of the conditioning that leads to the patterns. Like, Is there like a typical example perhaps? I'll give you a very um, normal and innocent example of how conditioning is actually the direct result of an emotional experience. Um, let's say that a very well-intentioned parent wants to teach their, their child to have good manners. They're very, very well-intentioned mm -hmm. and they, you know, they're like, well, I want to teach my children 
you know, thank you and, and sorry and and all of the good manners so they can have an easier time in the world being a human being because that's what's expected of them, sure. right? So the child asks for a toy and as the parent, you go to give the child the toy and the, the child goes to grab it and you're like, what did I say? You say thank you when somebody gives you something, right? Um, and the child ends up, you know, saying thank you. But the, the emotional experience that's actually happening for the child is, oh, in order for me to maintain a sense of attachment and a sense of belonging with this mm -hmm. very uh, influential person in my life, which I very much depend on, these behaviors are acceptable and these behaviors are not. Interesting. The, the, the child is not going to think, oh, I have to learn to say thank you because that's the nice thing to do. They're going to, to learn beha uh, behavior modification in order to please externally. Yeah, they're having to modify their own instinctual behaviors to adapt to that circumstance, I guess. Yes. And in the long term, because a, a lot of parents do that, for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Well-intentioned parents, I must say as well. Yes. Um, what do you think the long term negative side effects of, of that experience? Because you know, if, you, if you experience that multiple times a day mm -hmm. that becomes your new normal that's your conditioning so like what, what do you think the long-term effects of something like that might be um the the messaging that um somebody learns to internalize from um always being met with a certain set of expectations a certain set of rules a certain set of labels that they're expected to um uh meet and abide to is um, because the, the experience that they have of themselves doesn't match how, what they're being met with. For example, they, they, they experience a certain emotion or they experience a certain uh, state or um, they have a certain experience of themselves and they're being met with, no, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. These set of experiences and emotions and behaviors are only okay. So the message that is actually being internalized is not every part of me is okay and acceptable and lovable. Yeah. Right. And then they learn to construct certain identities, certain labels that they become hyper focused on because the 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 uh, goal is that if I can meet these expectations and I will be valuable and lovable and acceptable in the world. But we are human beings mm -hmm. with ever changing experiences of ourselves, ever changing emotions, ever changing thought patterns. And um, you're constantly being reinforced with only certain parts of me are okay. And so you show up in your relationships not showing all of who you are. You show up in your life repressing and shunning certain parts of who you are with always an, an underlying message of like, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. Yeah, it sounds like from a very young age you could learn that there are like rules and stipulations to getting the things that you might want or even whether that's like the love and affection of your parent and it's a really innocent example for sure and there are obviously much more significant traumatic emotional experience as well that yes. would certainly lead to a path where your brain is going to protect itself through these patterns mm -hmm. are there is there like an example like that anxiety super super common mm. disorder that we have especially now in our culture Yes. And let's just take the pandemic, for example, which was very scary for a lot of people for a long period, for a very sustained period of time. It's not like a two minute stress fight or flight experience. It was a 24 seven, th two, three year experience, like really th pushed at us mm -hmm. in every single possible direction. Every walk of life we're, we're thrown, at, thrown at with this fear. Um, and a lot of people haven't got over that. And they are now experiencing this anxiety. So the, let's say the pandemic is the example of this like very traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. And then with the anxiety that people have now of like not wanting to go out in public places, for example, or not wanting to invite family over at Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, is that is the is the anxiety that they feel now like part of that pattern? Um, I think anything that takes you out of a sense of belonging and peace and presence mm -hmm. is always um, your unconscious conditioning being at play, right? Um, with the pandemic, you know, it's, um, it's not just the fear and anxiety of 
like being sick or getting sick or there, there's also the, the whole world became unstable and the 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 very institutions that you thought were here to take care of you and the collective as well became a place that was unsure unstable and a place of mm-hmm. unsafety um and i think safety is an, another one of those emotional wounds that a lot of people have i know it's something i've had to really um look at and work on especially during the pandemic this sense of like unsafety that was constantly present Um, So like I was saying in the beginning, your life, whatever is happening externally is always going to be a mirror to the unconscious conditioning and the patterns that you have. So everything in your life is always an opportunity for you to look at yourself and being like, why am I experiencing this? What is coming up for me right now? And And an opportunity to deepen into that. Yeah, I feel like a lot of kids wait, um, maybe from my generation that grew up young with their sense of safety maybe in question perhaps you know um whether that was just from like tough parenting harsh parenting like trying to you know create strong individuals that maybe was a part of like the parenting strategy in like the 80s 90s perhaps and then when we see something like the pandemic where the fragility of all of our institutions are shown in broad daylight and Mm -hmm. how like fragile those are and how unstable they are and how unpredictable that they are um i'm sure that sense of fragility in that moment starts to impact those patterns that we learned when we were young right am i am i babbling on there or does that make sense no that makes sense i think obviously you know we have long lives and there's a lot of experiences that we have but you really set the foundation you create a certain foundation from the ages of zero till seven or eight and then everything that comes in through your experiences is kind of filtered through that unless and until it it can be really looked at so we yeah can you repeat that for us so from zero to seven or eight eight Mm -hmm. years of age we develop um some strong patterns for the rest of our lives you you create your your foundation for all of your beliefs and identities Uh, and the way that you see the world and and other people and the way you relate to the world and other people who are you in the Mm -hmm. face of the world and the people around you right yeah and we can't i mean i don't remember anything from when i was eight but we've obviously created such a large part of our brain and our consciousness of our of our own reality in that time Mm -hmm. so it only makes sense that 10 years 20 years 30 years later that you're not actually aware of the patterns that were solidified when you're eight years old. Yes, and a lot of, um, you know, that's why I talked in the beginning talking about nervous system work. Um, There's a lot of talks of like nervous system regulation out there, how to regulate your nervous Mm -hmm. system, how to learn to regulate your emotions. And I think um, a lot of it can be used to as a form of repression, actually. Okay. Uh, a lot of the work around nervous system is actually nervous system capacity that I do with my clients. What's that nervous system capacity? So I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say you have um, your partner says something that like pisses you off and you have a reaction of anger and mm-hmm. you like you get angry and you're like, oh, my gosh, he's such a jerk or whatever it is. And then you're like, OK, no nervous system regulation. It's OK. He didn't mean it calm your breath, calm your heartbeat, like I can move on, I don't need to be angry. That's nervous system regulation. Okay. And when you do that, you actually completely missed the opportunity to learn about yourself in that moment. And your partner, right? And your partner. Yeah. But again, everyone and everything is a reflection of you. Okay. Right? Gotcha. So the the nervous system capacity in this example would be like... um, the ability to hold a certain emotion or a certain state. Okay. Sometimes emotions and, and a certain state of being are so sensational for us that we try to uh, do something about them. So that might look like being passive aggressive or being directly aggressive mm-hmm. towards your partner to try to, um, to calm these sensations down or you try to repress. Okay. Right? Either deny the emotion is there in the first place or tell yourself that the emotion is useless and you shouldn't feel it in the first place. Mm-hmm or try to reason it down to okay. like calm yourself down. That's because you don't have enough nervous system capacity to be able to hold the emotion and bring neutrality to it. Interesting. Nervous system capacity would, would be the ability to be like, wow, 
I got really pissed off. What's happening in my body? Mm-hmm. Okay, my heart is beating. Um, I'm getting hot, you know? What is the... Uh, and when you're able to just be there with that emotion and bring a sense of neutrality and just hold it, you create the space to be able to be like, well, what was that about, mm-hmm. right? What is the internal dialogue that was happening in my head as the emotion was going on? Or the internal dialogue was, man, he's such a jerk. He never listens to me. He never see anything I do. It doesn't matter what I do. It's never seen. Right. And then you can be like, oh, I just felt very unappreciated in this moment. Well, where is that coming from? Do I feel this way often? Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, that comes up quite a bit in my relationships. But if you don't have the nervous system capacity to hold a certain state or emotion, you don't create the space that is needed in order to be able to um, surrender and follow the thread of truth right. that the emotion is here to actually bring you. So I imagine that example when some when something does come up and you get frustrated and annoyed and all those emotions start to, to bubble up inside of you. What you described there, that nervous system capacity, you're actually able to look at all of those things happening I just imagine it in my head as like a box of all these emotions just like trying to fight their way out of this box. But you're actually able to like sit there and be like and like analyze it and see what's going on rather than everything just like spilling out. And then, you, you know, you might get phys- you, you might get physical with your actions or you might get verbal with your actions. But it, it's coming out as a behavior that's certainly not a, a conscious thing that you're in control of, you know, when we're all stressed out and frantic. We're, we're certainly not like aware mm-hmm. of that. That's not like our norm. Yes. But this nervous system capacity that you're talking about creating that that space and time to analyze what's going on for you with your thoughts and also your feelings at the same time and then being able to i guess respond rather than react which i guess is the difference between i don't know do you not like those sayings no, no, okay. I, I do, I do. It's just the, 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 the like, 90% of the population are master repressors. Master repressors. So a lot of the very valuable information that's out there, a lot of people use to repress. Okay. Right? So I like how you said, you know, at first you said analysis. I always say that analysis is about 10 to 15% of actually uh, going down the path of undoing and, okay. I, and I'll tell you why. And when I say undoing, I mean undoing unconscious conditioning. Okay. In order to undo a certain conditioning, in order to actually heal from a certain emotional wound that was created in the past, you, um, you need to be able to go back to the emotional experience that happened that's at the very root of that specific unconscious conditioning. So it, the the process really takes time because mm-hmm. a lot of people, when they go, they go on the journey of like getting to know themselves and undoing unconscious conditioning, they get met with all of the expectations and all of the labels that they have of themselves. If they have an expectation and a, and a label that they have to be nice and they have to be accommodating and they have to be understanding, when they get to the stage of like nervous system capacity and they try to really look into a certain um, emotion or a certain state, if, if, um, if the dialogue, for example, that they're trying to, to, to hear from a certain emotion sounds like this, this, you know, he's a jerk, he never listens to me, blah, 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 blah. You might come in with your mind to reason away these thoughts. Oh, I shouldn't be thinking that. Mm-hmm. He's actually like a nice person. Like he actually does this and that for me, right? But it's never actually about the other person. It's always about you and getting to the root of what has you be a certain way, what has you tick, what has you um, get into your own way. And so in order to be able to get to the root of a certain emotional experience, it takes a lot of time to actually thaw and allow reality to exist as it is without you trying to interfere with what is actually present and for that you need to bring a lot of acceptance to what you're feeling in the moment and the actual healing part is when you get to the root of that um, unconscious conditioning of that emotional experience it's allowing yourself to feel it completely and wholeheartedly with full permission just because you love yourself that much so in order to really get to that, it takes a lot of time. And the, the time that it takes to thaw has nothing to do with analysis, right? Mm-hmm. It has to do with really a commitment to really know yourself inside and out and re-accept 
all of the parts of you that were um, unconsciously kind of um, you got the message that they were not okay or acceptable. That sounds like hard work, <laughs> honestly, but it also sounds super valuable and super necessary. It's um, it it can be hard work in the beginning because you're rewiring mm -hmm. so many um, way of thinking, but eventually you get to a place where it just becomes a way of life. Like if something ever happens in my life. I, I now have the tools to take the time to yeah. like look at what that is. It no longer takes weeks or months, right? It sounds like um, you're getting pe pe you're getting yourself into a place that's actually quite a normal way of how you're supposed to regulate yourself and experience and what we've kind of learned and been experienced to with unconditional um, unconscious unconditional patterns is not particularly a healthy or normal way that we would do that a lot of pe a lot of people's root cause of what they experience in their like now in their day-to-day -day, in their present is going to be stuff from when they were like really really young i said earlier i can't remember a lot of stuff from when i was eight nine ten years of age so how do mm -hmm. you work with somebody or how do you work with yourself mm -hmm. to find that root when it's so deep yeah, um, like I mentioned before, even a lot of the stuff can be pre-verbal. So before you even had the ability to speak. Wow. Um, <laughs> so that's that's where nervous system work really comes in because the the emotional wounds that were created were created emotionally and in your nervous system. So it's not necessarily um, needed to have a specific memory, a specific moment where everything changed. Mm -hmm. You know, often we don't even remember, we remember events how we experienced them. We never actually remember events as, as they were. Sure. Um, so it's not necessary to have a specific memory or a specific event. Uh, what comes with the work is learning to really trust what comes for you and that anything that comes up for you is completely valid and has a completely good reason to be there and it's trusting that you don't do anything because you're lazy or a bad person or uh, because you are too much or not enough mm -hmm. you always have a very good reason for any way of being that you have so it's being able to trust yourself and then something that I often bring to my work is parts work so um, I'll try not to get on too long of a rant here but what happens when you have an emotional wound is you you um, com compartmentalize a certain part of you. You separate your consciousness from a certain part of you. So when something comes up and you react and you get triggered or you get passive aggressive or you get defensive or combative or whatever, however that uh, pattern is showing up for you, it's being able to reconnect to that part of you mm -hmm. and and feel whatever that part of you is here to show you or, or is here to, to, um, to tell you through sensation, through your nervous system, through your emotions, because that was the language that you were speaking at the time. Yeah. What, does meditation come into this type of work? Like I just feel like you would have to quieten the mind and sit the body down to get into just a space to be able to like really feel and listen and dig deep into these things. Is, so is meditation a part of it? Yeah, um, I personally, I've been made it, I've been meditating for years and I, I do um, include it in my work. So I do a lot of uh, workshops and I include guided meditations. If I'm ever working with a client and I can see they're like, you know, struggling with something or, or um, grappling with something, I'll often pause and actually do a small guided meditation mm. to try to guide them internally to where they're trying to go, but they're too up here to go there. When I first started um, coaching me as the coachee with a coach, I, I went into the, the coaching relationship with, um, you know, oh, I'm like, I'm here because I want to build a business and have mm. all of these plans and blah, blah, blah. And for like a year and a half, every time I brought something to my coach, she was like, yeah, you got to slow down. You got to slow down. You got to slow down. I'm like, what does that mean? I'm not here <laughs> to slow down. Right. <laughs> But it's really the ability to slow down internally so you can actually be with reality as it is and with whatever is coming up for you without your mind trying to come in and like make it their own or like, you know, um, spin, spin you out of control, really. Yeah. Um, so I, I personally think meditation is very beneficial and I use it often, especially when doing parts work and mm -hmm. trying to connect with a certain part of you. So I think working with a coach is absolutely vital for 
anything if you wanted to get in shape if you wanted to start eating better if you wanted to start doing all these different types of things it's very good to have a support mechanism with you but what's interesting about that is you might see that person for an hour a week or an hour every couple of weeks and there are a lot of hours outside of that time so is there any like typical types of like homework you might give to somebody to actually like start practicing some of the things that you're working with yeah absolutely um my job as a coach is never to um to teach people how to heal or to teach people in a way it is but on a deeper sense people already know Mm -hmm. how to heal just like your body is always trying to get back to a state of homeostasis so is your emotional mental and spiritual well-being right Mm -hmm. so it's it's uh, helping people remember and giving them the tools to actually be able to to be empowered to do it on their own and so there's definitely homework and the, the work never stops because your life is constantly being a mirror to you for what is present for you as far as like patterns or beliefs or ways of being. You're constantly being met with um, the, the, the work, really, right? And so the, the coaching might be an hour a week or an hour every two weeks, but your life never stops and the, the lessons never stops and the teachings never stop. And so you always have opportunities to apply the tools. Um, and I, I do definitely give my, my clients homework. <laughs> what do you think is within our culture right now, which is poisoning a lot of people's nervous systems? physical and mental, I guess, that require to come and work with somebody like you? Mm. What I often say when I, when I do introduction workshops to unconscious conditioning is it is in our day and age, in our society, I don't, it's, it's impossible not to have unconscious conditioning mm-hmm. because we still live in a society that has so many rules and labels and expectations for how a human being is supposed to be. Right. What is acceptable, wasn't, what isn't acceptable. Um, and you can see it, especially in social media today, how somebody being having a different opinion as you or having a different way of thinking as you, they get canceled, they yeah. get attacked right away. That is, that is a, um, a manifestation of that internalized uh, pattern that permeates permeates throughout our society it it doesn't even have to be spoken it just is right so um you know i think healing little by little is a way to move forward in in creating a world where that's not necessarily as necessary as it is today um and i do believe the world is changing fast and that's why you're seeing so much instability in the world right now um but uh yeah it, it it is inevitable to to be completely without unconscious conditioning yeah i think for me i think that we have two words for me stick out separation and connection mm. and you think with the internet and social media you know these are supposed to be applications that we use to connect with one another but we become disassociated significantly and we have separations between our fellow human beings, whether that's mm-hmm. political, um, through you know, ed- educational opinions, religion, etc. There's so many different aspects that divides us and separates us. Yes. And unfortunately, it's actually happened very, really, really quickly where if you don't support Team Blue or Team Red, then you can't like literally be my friend. We can't talk about it because that's just so, for some reason that's so raw inside of me that brings up such a bucket of anger that I we we can't engage in in, in conversation. Yeah. Do you want to let the cat out? <laughs> in sorry, let the cat in. Yeah. I'm not going to edit this out. This is perfect. Okay. Nina's got a beautiful cat that <laughs> it's a bit cold out there now. She but he's inside. He's good. Yeah, and it's very vocal. Yeah. Um, I absolutely love what you say about separation and connection because on uh, whatever happens for you in your internal work, like there is, there is your individual conditioning and then there is the global conditioning. 
So whatever reactions you are experiencing that tells you what's out of alignment for you internally, the same is happening on a bigger scale mm -hmm. globally. So the reason why I say I believe the world is changing because of all of the instability that's going on is because the instability that's going on is just a reflection of a, a collective internal state that is out of alignment. Right. And in order for to bring it into alignment, you first need that awareness piece. And the way that the universe or whatever communicates through us is to bring it to the surface so we can look at it, yeah. right? Um, what happens internally inside of us with um, unconscious conditioning, with emotional wounds and patterns is, is always a separation. When you have that message that a part of you isn't okay, that a need that you have cannot be met or is only conditionally met or you don't deserve to have this need met, mm -hmm. uh, it creates separation inside of yourself. You, you actually create segmentation instead of yourself and it creates a separation. Um, and what we're seeing on a global scale right now is a, is a global manifestation of that internal wound that so many people have. Yeah. So doing the internal work to bring yourself back to a place of wholeness and reintegrate all of these parts of you actually plays a huge role in healing the external global manifestation of the separation that's actually going on right now. Yeah, I think that the powers that be that control our world are very aware of how separated and divided and f fighting tribal human beings are a lot easier to control than a united population. Mm -hmm. I think that um, the work that we need to do to, to heal and to become whole and to become powerful individuals, I think that that's a threat to many institutions. And I think that um, there's a huge deliberate factor of the fact that we you know, can't talk to a Republican or we can't talk to somebody who's a liberal, for example, um, that we really, really struggle with that. But I think that that is gonna blow up and I see it now, like more and more people are just absolutely desperate to be connected with their neighbor, with their community, um, to, to their family and friends. And there'll come a point where all of that external nonsense will remain nonsense and that true connectivity and that, that true communal part of us will just scream and explode mm. to the point where none of that other stuff will matter and we will just re re reunite and connect. And I see that more and more. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's going to be a huge part of how we um, heal from the last in the last three years of, of, of a pandemic which just split everybody up and create a lot of sadness and negativity and literal literal negative frequency around the world which is palpable mm -hmm. and you could feel it you could feel the fear around the world and mm -hmm. i think that we're going to get to a place where people are so desperate for that the frequencies of love joy happiness gratitude that that's what we're going to get drawn to the universe is going to pull that in for people when mm -hmm. people are slowly finding it every day and we'll get to a place of a lot more ha harmonious and a lot of the walls that we've created mm. physically and psychologically are going to break down. Yeah. Um, what I love about that is that sometimes when it feels like your life is falling apart and there's all of these things happening to you, um, which is actually just a way for your system of the universe to bring to you what is out of alignment, the universe is bringing it to you because you've already asked for it. Mm -hmm. Your soul on some level has already asked for something more, for something better, for something more fuller. And so the process through which you have to go through is uncomfortable. It's going to bring up all of the things that are out of alignment so you can look at it. So again, when you look at a global scale, there's so many people that are so desperate for connection mm -hmm. and to be connected to one another we have asked for in a way what is actually happening in the world right now it is the universe being like look at everything that is out of alignment before you can get to a place of connection there's all of these things you got to look at right yeah it's a wild topic and it's it's literally a global phenomenon but i think yeah more and more people you see more and more um practitioners you see more and more like doctors even talking about talking about this it's becoming a little bit more, more mainstream mm -hmm. and it's my yes. hope it's my hope that more and more people get educated get get connected to individuals like yourself and start wanting to do the work and get excited excited about doing that mm -hmm. and also like what we spoke about what you spoke about earlier about that like 
forgiveness and understanding of those things that do come up for people which have been like set from decades ago rather than like repressing that more or ignoring it kind of cuddling those things up Mm -hmm. and working with somebody to, to kind of would you say work through work through it or rather than like fighting it like it's definitely like you it's more of a uh, a cuddling rather than a a, com, a combat combative element. yeah i mean i don't know if, if cuddling is the right word because yeah. i you know as a coach you have to say the hard truth sure. that people don't want to hear that their egos are fighting mm. which there can't be any cuddling for that <laughs> um but definitely the only way out of something especially a pattern or you know a certain wound is through it Mm -hmm. anything else is a form of repression and only perpetuates what is there and and um lets the wound fester you know absolutely do you you think that so this unconditioned sorry this unconscious conditioning Mm -hmm. is it do you think it's completely is it avoidable or are there some aspects of it where people we have to just learn to live with it that's a good question that i don't know if i have a definite answer for um something that i've definitely uh experienced on my own personal journey is whenever i've i've been able to work through something to the point of healing to the point where i'm able to feel it feel it wholeheartedly and reintegrate it and accept it i feel so much stronger and whole than i i would have if i didn't have it in the first place the 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 act of going through it and getting to know yourself in that way um had there's a lot of power to it it is very powerful Uh, i do think that the world is evolving forever changing forever evolving and humanity as a race is trying to get to a point where it doesn't have to be so hard there doesn't have to be so much struggle and so much healing that would need to happen in order to get to a place of wholeness or maintain a place of wholeness so if unconscious conditioning is avoidable at all, I don't think it's going to be for many thousands of years. Right. <laughs> now, that's a fair comment. Yeah, I I hear, well, I've heard in the past about the majority of the, the things that we think, do, and say, like 90% of them are like unconscious, unconscious patterns that happen for us by the age of like 25 or 30, for example. So the majority of the things we think, mm-hmm. do, and say are like, they're not really things that we think about and then say, feel or do and it's certainly true certainly like me back in the past that was certainly true and i think for a lot of people can resonate with that as well but i think it's about like tipping the scales a little bit towards like do we have the ability for 95 percent of what we think feel and do Mm -hmm. is conscious and we're aware of it Mm -hmm. and we're in the present moment and it's not being dictated by our past patterns Mm -hmm. um i think there's an interesting conversation to be had about like trying to like tip the scales a little bit especially a lot of people who do like work like Dr. Joe Dispenza and Mm. um, Bruce Lipton, they certainly work on using meditation and other tools to allow people to become more aware in their present body, create Mm -hmm. more of a a brain body connection. So you're actually being able to feel your body in the present moment and not being dictated by the emotions of like the past or the future. And to, um, to start breaking down those subconscious patterns that we, that we have, that we have dealt with, that we've spoke about in the past. Mm -hmm. But I want to talk to you about parents and kids Mm. because your example was interesting earlier. Like I certainly don't do that to my kids, that Mm. example that you had, but um, I used to have a, I had a very small business in Sweden when I was a preschool teacher Mm -hmm. over there a whole life two lifetimes ago preschool teacher yeah i've I've got (laughs) lots of stories i could tell you yeah but yeah so i um i i wasn't comfortable with how parents like insisted and even made their kids say please and thank you Mm -hmm. these four-year-old i had four four four-year-old kids in my class and i was just like okay first of all they've only been on the planet for four years they've only been conscious for four years Mm -hmm. and to have the expectation that they would say the same types of things that are grown person would do is it's not a really it's not an expectation you should really have Mm -hmm. but there's also a place to obviously help nurture the use of certain words in certain circumstances you can't really get through your adult life without saying please thank you open doors and having manners right but there's Mm -hmm. a time and a place to learn that and as a and, and how you do that is very important as well so i was really uncomfortable with like i would give a i remember giving a gift to a like a six year old Mm -hmm. and then there was a pause and i was kind of like waiting for a response 
but I didn't get one and it didn't bother me. It's okay, like, you know, I gave this, this kid a present. I wasn't expecting anything in return. I wasn't like, I didn't want anything back from this gift. And mm-hmm. then the parents pipe up and talk about like, what do you say to Simon? Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. And it's just it, this disingenuine response, yes. right? And that bothered me. So I was like, how can we create like a different way of the kids wanting to use these words? Mm-hmm. So I, I created this very small clothing line of like very colorful shirts and very bubbly writing. And it mm-hmm. was like, there was, I think there was three or four, but it was a combination of Swedish and English. One said like, thank you. One said taximika, which is thank you very much in Swedish. And I think the other one was like cheers and hi. Mm-hmm. And basically the kids, we had this like really funny, like tickle box and all these shirts were thrown inside. And each kid would go and pick a shirt. They'd look at it. They'd talk about what they had and they'd wear it. Mm-hmm. And they were actually like that word for the day so that their word for the day was like please or they had thank you on and they would kind of use that and they would and then they would end up using these words in a fun in a fun way Mm -hmm. which i don't know like i'm not a psychologist or a child psychologist but i thought that'd be a a much more interesting way for a child to learn through play Mm -hmm. how powerful language is and especially these types of words um so how do you think parents can help their children um develop i guess healthy patterns because everything we do think and say right now it's all patterns of some some sort that we've learned that we are exhibiting but like how can we do our very best because we're not gonna do a perfect job Mm -hmm. of of trying to get our kids to exhibit these healthy patterns um there's a lot there and I, i loved everything that you said um so children develop like child development is actually something i'm very passionate about I actually, before I got into nutrition, I went to school for child studies because I wanted to work with children. And I worked with children for 10 years in, you know, various capacities as in like preschools, daycares as a nanny. I didn't know that. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, one of the one of the methods that we learned was the Montessori method, which is that a learn uh, a child learns through play. Yeah. This is how children learn. This is the language of children. So I I love the method that you use there. I always it always also always bothered me when I saw like you know um, people or parents again very well intentioned saying to the kids you have to say sorry what do we say we say thank you and the, the kid says it but the kid doesn't mean it right yeah. um, so I don't have any children yet I, I have one on the way obviously and it's something I think about a lot and, and I, I'm saving a lot of videos from very competent uh, therapists and child psychologists that I really like and it's your question is interesting as well because you're like how can we create healthy patterns a pattern in and of itself um means that there is an emotional wound to begin with that's interesting right so uh there, there's two things i want to say to that i don't have a definite answer for how to teach our children how to say sorry thank you and please in a genuine way uh, I haven't experienced that yet with my own children. Something that I've been looking at and that I absolutely believe is that uh, always coming back to a place of connection with your child is what will give them the space to to be able to express themselves in a genuine way. Mm-hmm. So instead of being like, you say sorry, you say thank you, it's creating a space, a space of connection to invite them to say, to say these things if these things if they want to a child is not incapable of feeling gratitude a child is not incapable of of expressing um you know these these like words these manners uh and children also go through developmental stages so understanding the developmental stages that they go through um because for the for the longest not for the longest time but for the first few years of their life they are the center of their own universe yeah that's that's just their experience at the time that develops eventually as they grow older but for a few years they are at the center of their sure. whole world right so i don't know if i answered your question yeah. at all but um I, I think when you force a child to say certain words because that's what's proper you there's a lack of connection there and the child might might say it but they definitely don't mean it mm-hmm. um and it's creating a space to to um teach your children that it's okay to feel whatever they're feeling and to help them understand and deepen into what it is that they are feeling from a place of just wanting to connect with them rather than expecting a certain behavior from them yeah one thing i've learned with kids is that if you provide them the space and the love and the support where they feel they feel like they're not going to be abandoned 
mm-hmm. and they feel loved and they feel that warmth then they will they will be authentic and they will pick up i don't want to say what's right in the world but they will pick up your mannerisms mm-hmm. for sure and i can say with 100 percent confidence that when there is that example of when a parent says what do you say or say thank you or say sorry and i've i've done this for sure Mm -hmm. but um it comes from a place where you don't as a parent you don't want the other parents to think that you have a horrible child that has you're a bad parent yeah it's got nothing to do with the child (laughs) yeah it's got nothing to do with teaching them manners and wanting them to be polite and want them to grow and and benefit from learning language it's got nothing to do with that it's about your own ego as a parent Mm -hmm. and not wanting to um have other human beings think that you've raised a nasty little devil when they're four years old and you know they are they've got the ability to be nervous and shy very very quickly and they don't have 30 40 years of experience of human interaction they just don't have that so you can't have that same expectation so you did answer that question thank you very much we're going to we're going to clarify the question that we asked at the top of the show. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we've covered unconscious conditioning and what, how that differs to the patterns and how that um, works to the present day and consciousness as well. And I think we can get you back on the show to talk a little bit more about consciousness because I think that's an interesting topic. Mm-hmm. It's being studied more and more these days and it's such a beautiful, wild um like supreme consciousness is a, like a goal that people really want to obtain and you know some people do it mm-hmm. um so the question we have to ask at the top of the show is what can i do today to bring awareness to my unconscious unwanted patterns um before i answer that can i add something to the child parent relationship because uh, you did ask me what can parents do to instill healthy patterns in their children mm-hmm. um the people closest to you in your life will trigger you in ways that nobody else can. Oh, yeah. And there's a reason for that. And children trigger you more than anything because you see yourself in them mm-hmm. so much. And so th- the way that you can really truly help your child grow in a way that is wholesome and free is to do the work yourself yeah. so you don't transmit whatever is healed inside of you. Um, even the the... the most well-intentioned parents who are very careful with what they say and how they say it to their children. Children pick up on nonverbal cues and on how you you are in the world way more than yeah. you teaching them or saying a certain thing. So they'll be observing you. They'll be observing how you live your life, how you repair certain things because we're not perfect. We're human. Mm-hmm. We might like have a reaction or do something that we're not proud of. How do you repair that situation? How do you, do you come back to your child and say, hey, look, I yelled and I, I, that wasn't right. I got overwhelmed by my emotions and I'm sorry. How did that make you feel? Or see how you, you might repair something with your partner, right? So the best way I believe to um, help children grow without emotional wounds or without yeah. um, as much unconscious conditioning or patterns um, is really to do the work on yourself first. Yeah, I think recognizing the the individualism with the kids as well like mm. they were, are going to be very very similar to you and mum but also recognizing that they are their own organism they are their own identity they are their own everything yeah and it's important to recognize that there are going to be like differences there and there's going to be unique things within that person and that's obviously okay and we have to want to like nourish that because we don't want to be raising like mini me's yes i yeah. love that yeah i totally agree yeah, the kid piece is very, very interesting, and there's there's so much to it, and there is there's like, there must be ten thousand parenting books out there, and they can't all be right, and they can't be wrong. So it's like I think that we survived as human beings for a good two hundred thousand years before there were printed books, and I guess they all they could do was work with their instincts and work with the natural ways that they had that they could do with you know so like yeah yeah there's there's obviously lots to learn from books but also working with like yourself and being confident with that there's a big big value to that but Mm -hmm. the question the other question at the top of the show is going to be what can i do today to start bringing awareness to my unconscious unwanted patterns um i like this question because it implies that you have to do something right (laughs) Um, but you actually can live your life and your life will show you where you're out of alignment. 
So any situation in your life where you notice yourself uh, coming out of a peaceful, empowered state is going to be an opportunity for you to um, to look at a certain pattern. So s somebody says something that triggers you, you find yourself getting upset or passive aggressive, or you find yourself going into an autopilot way of being, uh, that is an opportunity for you to like pause and being like, what is that about? Nothing that is happening internally and inside of you is ever your partner's fault, the government's fault, the fault of whatever is happening externally in your external circumstances. Uh, it is only pushing a button inside of you and then holding up a mirror. So then it's the whole work of like slowing down and being like, oh, I am the common denominator of my experiences. Mm -hmm. What is this mirror here to show you about myself? What can I learn here about myself? So it's, it's um, I don't know if it's a really practical answer. <laughs> I, think, I think most people can certainly take something from that and they can see or recognize times in their lives when that's a factor. And I think there's multiple times during a day where you'll be able to recognize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, do you have any, there's obviously so many books and podcasts about this topic, which is wonderful. Mm. Do you have any favorites that you'd like to maybe recommend people grab? Yeah. I mean, there's people that I follow that I absolutely love. Um, a great uh, person to look at when looking at um, the way that everything in our life is a mirror mm -hmm. is Byron Katie. She's someone that has helped me tremendously in my life through her work. Her work is literally called The Work. Um, and so I think a good book to start with might be Loving What Is. Um, beautiful book that's helped me a lot. Um, I love people like Gabor Mate as well as someone I, I, I follow and listen to a lot. Um, a book that's... I think changed my life more than any other, um, which is more on the spiritual side, but it's Conversations with God. Uh, that's a book that's I read at the moment that I needed to read mm -hmm. it and brought me a lot of peace and answers um, when it came to the human experience. Nice. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. Mm. That's good. That'll keep people busy. Yeah. Okay. Good work. <laughs> um, can you let us know where people can maybe connect with you and learn more about your work? Yeah, so they can definitely find me on Instagram. Uh, my name is Nino.Vuk. So Nino is N-I-N-O-N, -N, the French version. Nino. Nino. <laughs> uh, dot V-U-K. Um, I think the best way to stay in touch with what I'm up to and what I'm doing and where I actually send a lot of free content um, and, and opportunities to connect with me is via my email list. So um, if people go to Nino vukovic.aweb.page so n-i-n-o-n v-u-k-o-v-i-c dot aweb a-w-e-b dot page they can sign up for my mailing list um, I send a lot of free stuff and there's a lot of free workshops and free guided meditations that I send and then whenever I'm up to something and there's like a program coming out um, I, I let them know via email and then they can always respond directly back to me via email if, if they want to connect amazing I'll make sure all that information is in the show notes of the podcast and people can get hold of you thank you but Nina, that's it. Thank you so much for coming onto the show and talking about um, all things unconscious conditioning. Such a big, beautiful topic, and I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. That was I had a really good time. Oh, <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Well, that is it for this episode of True Hope Cast, the official podcast for True Hope Canada. I hope you enjoyed the show. Again, if you want to connect with Nino or you want to check out some of those awesome books and references, you can look in the show notes and get connected with that. But that is it. We'll see you next week. Thanks. <laughs>